In recent episodes, we talked about how we are apes, hominoids, specifically great apes, or hominids, being members of the taxonomic family hominidae, the ape family. In the last episode, we talked about one tribe of the hominid family, hominini, but we only talked about one branch of that tribe, pan, being common chimpanzees, also known as troglodytes, and their sister species, bonobos. In this episode, we'll talk about the other branch of hominini, the subtribe hominina. And this is the first time in this whole series where we've come to a clade where we are the only surviving species. There are no other surviving species besides ourselves. There, there were plenty of other hominins living long ago, as you'll see in a moment, but every other branch of this tree has since died out except for us. Now, back in Darwin's day, the only apes anyone knew about were the ones that were still hanging around. And since then, scientists have discovered dozens and dozens more species that no one has ever seen alive. And some of them look more like uh, basal monkeys than any modern ape, and, but there were some that were much more humanoid than some folks are comfortable with. And those who don't want to accept certain realities like evolution often point out that Charles Darwin had admitted a lack of transitional fossils, which was true in his day. Very few fossils of any kind were yet known by then, just enough to realize that there were several vast periods of time before our time, before people existed. In fact, paleontologists continue to lament an extreme rarity of such fossils even into the 1970s. But today's science deniers act as if there are still no transitional species known now, which just isn't true anymore. In fact, there's been a paleontological boon since then, such that more species have been discovered in the last three decades than in the last three centuries prior. It's not like there were no transitional species at all even then. In fact, Darwin listed several intermediate forms of living mammals and other animals, and he made specific predictions about precisely what sort of transition to look for in certain fossil lineages, like from dinosaurs to birds or from apes to man. He imagined a great chain of being in which there was then one link missing between generalized apes and the earliest human remains yet known at that time. Darwin predicted the traits of this so-called missing link, a species that had not yet been discovered, but that he said we should expect to find if his theory is correct, and only if his theory is correct, because such species should not exist otherwise. Eventually, of course, they did find exactly what he predicted. The first several increments of the dinosaur to bird transition was announced just two years after he called for it, while Darwin was still alive, so he must have felt pretty good about that. But the first of what turned out to be multiple no longer missing links in the ape to man transition wasn't announced until a hundred years later in 1974. That was the famous fossil female known as Lucy, the first known representative of her species Australopithecus afarensis. That does not mean that anyone ever thought that that particular individual, Lucy, was the great great grandmother of all humanity. We're not looking for a direct ancestor. We're looking for a species that is morphologically intermediate between two closely related lineages, sharing characteristic traits from either or both and having some that are developed part way between the two. That's what a transitional species is, and we've shown many of them in this series already. Australopithecus afarensis is a perfect example of a transitional intermediate because it was a fully bipedal ape whose hands, feet, teeth, pelvis, skull, and other physical details were all exactly halfway between traditional concepts of apes and of humans, just as Darwin predicted. And laymen ask me all the time, how come they ain't never found no missing link? And I answer, they did, uh, almost a half century ago. Where have you been? And since then, we've found hundreds more individuals of her species, as well as several other closely related species within that same lineage, being the taxonomic subtribe that we're talking about today. Actually, Australopithecus africanus was discovered first, nearly a hundred years ago. But it took decades for the scientific community to realize what they had, with fragments of different individuals being squirreled away in filing cabinets. There are a handful of times when transitional species have been rediscovered in a drawer, having been filed and forgotten without ever being properly identified. The history of human evolutionary ancestry is not a chain, as Darwin described it and others have since famously depicted it. Instead, it's a continuation of the branching tree pattern that it's always been, as we've seen from the beginning of this series. The crown, or beginning, of our new sister clade to the chimps is probably best represented by Sahelanthropus tecadensis, 
an early hominin dating back six or seven million years ago, right when the molecular clock predicted our division, when what would eventually become chimpanzees diverged from what would later become humans. Sahelanthropus was not a chimpanzee itself, although it was very similar, nor was it yet human, though it was definitely intermediate. Sahelanthropus was succeeded by Auroran tugenensis from 6.1 to 5.7 million years ago. 20 individuals have been found since Y2K. Then we have two more concurrent species, nearly a dozen Artipithecus cadaba and roughly a hundred Artipithecus ramidus, the most famous of these being an individual known as Artie. After that came the Australopithecines. The first of those to be discovered and recognized were the more traditionally ape-like robust Australopithecines, now known as Paranthropines. Paranthropines. These include Paranthropus robustus, Aethiopithecus, and Boisei. Then a second branch was discovered for the much more humanoid Gracile Australopiths, Australopithecus afarensis, Africanus, Anamensis, Garhi, Sediba, and Baragazali. And maybe even Kenyanthropus platyops, which has been associated or confused with Australopiths and with primitive humans because the gradations or differences now are so slight that it's difficult to tell us apart anymore. That's another way to identify a perfect transitional species when there is disagreement as to which side it should be on because it aligns equally with either one. All of these have been found in Africa within a range of six million years or so, with the, least of, with the last of them going extinct just over a million years ago. And all of them bear traits indicative of their diet and bipedal locomotion. By four million years ago, their lush jungle environment had transformed into woodlands requiring a change in diet. And chimpanzees are omnivorous, hunting in coordinated groups to eat meat when they can get it. But they, like we, have trouble digesting unprocessed meat, so they are still primarily vegetarian. And according to their dentition, Artipithecus was eating fruits and leaves like chimpanzees do. But Australopithecus teeth have more enamel than modern apes and were one and a half times larger than those of chimpanzees, implying that Lucy was eating things like roots and tubers instead. Another way that we know this is the difference in carbon fixation between uh, common C3 plants and the tougher C4 plants. Australopith teeth bear an increased C4 chemical signature, indicating a tougher diet. Robust paranthropines had relatively thick bones, too, implying especially tough foods like sorghum, millets, and other C4 grasses. And these facts, in addition to associated fossil uh, plants, indicate a more open environment like a sparse forest or savanna, rather than a jungle. Thus, hanging around in the trees was increasingly restrictive because there's not a continuous canopy anymore. The fewer trees in a given area, the more you have to walk between them. So they had to get down on the ground to get around. Standing, uh, standing tall is an advantage in high grass and walking bipedally is even more efficient. First of all, uh, standing erect cuts down on the heat absorption because it minimizes the surface area under direct tropical sunlight. Then, a human burns 50 calories walking three kilometers, where a chimpanzee, emulating on all fours, burns 140 calories over that same distance, nearly three times as much. And that is with the sun baking his back, too. Imagine the effects of all that over many generations, just as a matter of population mechanics. Australopus weren't just chimpanzees walking upright, either. They had some other mods that made them even more efficient at it, including a gluteus minimus muscle connecting to the ilium. Now, this helps rotate the femur in concert with the hips. In chimpanzees, the pelvis goes more to the back, prompting an awkward gait, but Australopiths had their legs together beneath the body, not splayed out like in chimps. And these adaptations improved walking, but they didn't solve every problem associated with that. For example, the foramen magnum relates to herniated discs because of how they now have to bear our body weight stacked up like that. And bipedalism causes other issues, too, which are especially obvious when watching pregnant women try to walk, or rather, waddle. And bipedalism also limits arboreal ability. To excel at one means to give up the other. And the arch in our feet is like a suspension bridge to better support our entire weight on one foot at a time as we alternate between them with each step. Chimpanzees have flat feet, not good for carrying their weight on only two feet for very long. Artipithecus had a slight arch, even though it lived among abundant trees, so it was better at walking longer distances. And Australopithecus was even better still because it added a small but elastic Achilles tendon, improving their gait by adding a spring to their step. You know, some people think that Australopiths were just chimpanzees, but 
These were traits that chimps don't have. And the question now is how, when, and why did bipedalism come about? A couple episodes ago, I posed the question of whether our ancestors had ever walked on our knuckles like some other apes do, or whether we were always bipedal since hominid day began. The evidence I presented then was not just that the most primitive apes we still have walk erect on the ground, it's also that some dryopiths in Europe were apparently bipedal too, as was Artipithecus and Sahelanthropus in Africa. Since that video, scientists have announced the discovery of yet another European ape. Danuvius Guggenmosi was a fully bipedal yet arboreal hominid who lived in Bavaria 11,620,000 years ago. And this discovery was expected, even predicted, Yet the news media always has to sensationalize every story as if every new fossil causes scientists to rethink their theories, even when all it really does is confirm what we already suspected, as is usually the case. Yet one question remains. Was knuckle walking a trait that gorillas and chimpanzees both resorted to after being suspensory? Meaning, did our, were our ancestors hanging from their arms until they dropped to their feet and stood up straight and started walking erect the way that gibbons do both on the trees and on the ground? that's possible. It doesn't seem likely that gorillas are knuckle walkers and chimpanzees are knuckle walkers, but that we, emerging essentially between them, never were. Now, that would mean that both of them resorted to the same practice independently. But we know that orangutans chose fist walking independently. We also know that knuckle walking and fist walking are secondary characteristics that the earlier, more primitive apes walked on their whole hands. So why would they have shifted to walking on their fists or their knuckles instead? That shift could not have been an abrupt one. There has to have been a period when the ancestors of all great apes were predominantly bipedal on the ground, just as lesser apes still are. Whatever is the case, we'll walk from here, as every species from this point on has done. That's what hominina stands for, walking erect. And if you can stand erect, then maybe you can stand being hominina.